Blog Talk Radio. All right, everybody, you're listening live to another edition of ATL Prime Sports. Todd Quarter here in Atlanta. JJ with me on the other side of the ATL, Mark Mancini in Los Angeles, and our producer Wayne in Memphis, Tennessee. We have Anthony Atkinson joining us here shortly on ATL Prime Sports to be our guest. He's a former Harlem Gulp Trotter. He's also the head basketball coach at Wilson Prep Academy in Wilson, North Carolina, the 1A state champs. And here's the big headline, NCAA 2 national champion at Barton College. 14 years ago, he orchestrated the greatest comeback in NCAA tournament history. It was in 2007. It's remarkable. Go check out the video. As soon as he comes on, we will bring him on. Let's go ahead and go to some breaking news in the meantime. Uh, J.J., take it away with Deshaun Watson, my friend. Yeah, man, you said it. Breaking earlier this morning, four more civil lawsuits have been filed against the Texans quarterback, Deshaun Watson, alleging inappropriate conduct, sexual assault during massages. Uh, Boy, this is huge news. We all know Watson was recently in the news as being disgruntled with his Team, the Houston Texans uh, was demanding a trade, and now one allegation popped up. He denied it. Then two quick ones popped up. Now it's a total of seven. Uh, these uh, these allegations, folks, we should take them as such. They are serious. But until Deshaun Watson has his day in court, he is innocent until proven guilty. We do need to remember that. And, folks, this is a right now a civil lawsuit. Nothing more, um, but again, it is just seven turtle lawsuits against Deshaun Watson, the Texans quarterback. Really breaking news, really big news. This could really impact the Texans, how they unload them, how they move forward. They did just sign Tyrod Taylor. All this is interconnected, unfortunately, but again, he is innocent until proven guilty, and I'll pass it to you guys, man. This is mind-boggling. You know what? It's going to impact the Texans. Um, uh, uh, you know, chances of, of, of trading uh, Deshaun right now. Clubs are going to steer away from this until the until this situation goes away, and it doesn't look like it's going to go away before the draft. So this puts the Houston Texans in a tremendous pickle. Your thoughts, uh, Mark? Well, I'll tell you, I don't under, quite understand this whole situation. I think JJ laid it out perfectly. I mean, if you got that much money and you got this kind of fetish where you need to have women every time. Just single-handedly go buy yourself a hooker every night and have a day of rest, and, and, and that'll solve the problem. I don't understand this thing. I mean, these guys are out there trying to buy apple martinis and buy a cheap steak dinner and think they're going to get more than that. These women aren't dumb. They know what's at stake here, and now they're coming out to the forefront. I think by the time this thing is all said and done, it's going to be five, six women coming out of here. No wonder he wants to get out of town. Well, you know what? And like J.J. said, Innocent and true, proven guilty. The process will play itself out. The NFL will investigate it. And, you know, but more importantly, I mean, there's really nothing more important than that. But more importantly for the for the Houston Texans, they're in limbo. Nobody's going to make a trade during this process. And, it, and it's going to go beyond the draft. I, I, there's no way, the way it's going right now, that it just started. It's going to go beyond the draft. And that's going to affect what the Houston Texans wanted to do in the draft and and what and, and also affect affect trading him if they indeed can find a partner to suit them. So guys, this is a huge story. Um we have Anthony Atkinson on the line, uh former whole Harlem Gold Trotter, head basketball coach at Wilson Prep Academy in Wilson, North Carolina, the one A state champs, the NCAA to national champion at Barton College 14 years ago. He orchestrated the greatest comeback in NCAA tournament history in 2007. Anthony, welcome to ATL Prime Sports, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome anytime, sir. Um, I would like you to go back and tell us what happened, first of all, in 2007 Take us back to the end of the game when this comeback started, how it started, what was your impact, and what was being said on the bench, and what was the feel on the court 
in the stands and et cetera, because when I watched the tape at the beginning, and I still remember this game, I thought it was over. You had other plans. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of people thought it was over, even the ones back at home. And I think some of the stands thought it was over. But uh, we had actually been in a lot of those situations all year. And um, being in those situations, we felt confident, even you know, with only about 40 seconds left in the game, that you know we could make something happen. And um, we just believed in ourselves, and we believed, and we just said, let's go ahead and lay it all on the line. But me personally, that was my last game, my senior year, last college game on the big stage. And, you know, I just I didn't want to go out without a fight, me personally. And I, but the team was the same way. Everything was encouraging on the bench. You know, we were just saying, you know, let's keep fighting, let's keep fighting. And, you know, next thing you know, they started missing free throws. We started, I started making shots. We, uh, my teammates started getting defensive stops and everything like that. And when you look up, you know, we were down, <clears throat> I think, after the uh, the layup when I got fouled, uh, I had a chance to go to the free throw line and tie it. And uh, I actually short-armed it, and I hit the front of the rim. And um, they went down, and um, I was very frustrated because I, I, that was something that me and my father worked on uh, when I was since I was a little boy, finishing the game off, tying the ball game, pressure on the line, everything like that. And um, they went down, but I'm actually glad it worked out that way because let's say I hit that, that free throw, they hold the ball for the last second shot, and we possibly don't get another shot at the basket. <laughs> so being that we missed, that I missed a free throw and we fouled, they went down and they missed the free throw, so they were up two after he made the second one. And I came down and made a reverse layup. And then on the inbounds play, when we were playing defense, it was a drill that we did all year called a Peyton drill, and we hated it because it was a back tip drill. We just hated to do it in practice. We never liked to do it. But it actually worked out for us right here because he started dribbling, and uh, Bobby Buffalo came from behind and uh, back tipped it. And when we got it, I looked up at the clock. Just my instinct told me to look up at the clock so I could see if I had to shoot a three-point shot or if I could make it to the basket. And a couple of nights before, I had made it link to the floor in like 3.9 seconds and got off a three-point shot and got a good shot off. So I figured I could make it to the basket. And if not, it doesn't count. You know, we're going to overtime. But uh, I took off and I made it to the basket. And I actually thought I missed the layup at the end because I was going so fast. I thought the momentum might make the ball, you know, come off a little hard off the front of the rim. But when I looked back, it was in. It was going through the net. And next thing you know, you know, pandemonium broke out and I was going crazy. I didn't really know how to act, as you can see from my celebration running around the court and everything like that. But uh, it was a great day. It's something I definitely never forget. You know, anytime I feel down or anything like that. I just click on that video and I go back to, you know, just look at, you know, how great that day was and it motivates me every time. What was the atmosphere in the stands during that game? I mean, a lot of folks probably thought it was over, Anthony. And like I said, you had other ideas. You talked about the influence that your father had on you. Were you thinking of your dad during the game at all and, 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 and what he taught you when you were young? And, and tell me about what was going on. What, what, what was it like on the court and in the stands? Compare that. I think, um, you know, it's just like what you dream about when you're a little kid. It's the same scenario. You're in a driveway, you know, 20-some seconds left, and, you know, you come down and you're counting down to yourself. Then you act like you go down and foul somebody, they miss a free throw, then you come back down and make another bucket. Everything was playing out in my mind then. And actually, every shot that I made in that last 40 seconds, 45 seconds, was a shot that me and my father worked on. We used to train when I was younger. And, um, you know, I would look up at him every now and then, and, my dad was cool as a cucumber. He wouldn't make many faces or anything like that. My mom, on the other end, she was a nervous wreck. She was, you know, uh, walking back and forth the whole time, praying and just asking God for us to win and things like that. And that's kind of like how the fans were. Once we were down, it was kind of like some fans were sad. But once we started making a comeback, you could see the fans, you know, everybody holding hands, praying and things like that. So the momentum switched from, you know, real quick from their side to our side. And what's crazy is I actually heard that they had rolled out, like, the championship T-shirts and put them on their side because they thought that the game was over. And all the media had ran to their side. So when I hit the game-winning layup, our media guy from Wilson was the only one down at our end. So he's the only one that got a great clip of the uh, – a great photo of the last second layup that I made. But um, it was – honestly, it was something that I had prepared for. You know, I, I, we had been in so many scenarios. I think that year we, in my senior year at Barton, we won nine overtime games. So, like I said, you know, we were used to that. But being on that stage in that arena for a national championship, your last game of your college career, 
you can't beat that, and that in turn has helped me to be a high school coach to where I don't really panic in a lot of situations. So. You're listening to Anthony Atkinson, head coach of the Wilson Prep men's team in Wilson, North Carolina, right here on ATL Prime Sports. Anthony, I'm JJ. It's nice to meet you. I want to talk to you about your current coaching gig. You guys yes, just sir. won the state title. Uh, you only played a four-game regular season with all uh, the commotion of COVID and everything else involved. Describe what that championship was like compared to the historic championship, your uh, Barton College team, and that you were a part of in 2007. What's it like as a coach uh, versus as a player? And uh, talk about your high school team. I think uh, comparing that to a player is very hard because as a player, you know, like I said, that was my senior year, my last game. You win a national championship as a player, and I had aspirations to go on and play professional basketball. But um, on the coaching side of it, it was so satisfying because you're more invested into seeing young kids and young men, you know, see the full potential that they have in themselves. And once they see that and they accomplish something so, so great as, they, as what they did, um, you know, it's very satisfying. And that's the whole reason why I came back home after playing 12 years on the road with the Globetrotters. That was one of my dreams, to come back and help these kids out in my hometown. And, you know, nobody in our hometown, men's-wise, has won a state championship or even been there since the year 1984. So we wow. made history out of, after 37 years, and that's actually the year I was born in 1984. So uh, it's all kind of crazy how things work. But, um, you know, my team, we were, re- we were very – I had some tough kids. To go through everything we went through, our first three games were canceled because of COVID, on the, because other teams had COVID. And then we played two games, lost them to a great team in Greenfield. And then right after that, we got COVID, so we had to quarantine for 18 days. Right after quarantine – come out one day of practice, and then we go play two conference games that week. And, you know, we played well. And um, I was so proud of we won the conference, and then we ended up getting a three, number three seed in the playoffs. And, you know, we ran the table, so to speak, and we played some very good teams in the playoffs. We played an undefeated team that was ranked all year, number one in 1A. Then we played defending state champions. Then we played a number two or three team that was ranked all year in 1A. And then we played Lincoln Charter. They were ranked number two all year in 1A. So, you know, our road to the championship was not an easy one. We went, we overcame a lot, but I have tough kids, and I think that's the biggest testament and the biggest, you know, compliment you can give kids nowadays because a lot of kids struggle from mental toughness, I think, and that's the difference between my generation when we came up and a generation now. But my kids mm-hmm. are very mental t- mentally tough, and I challenge them on that every day in practice because I tell everybody, you, it's a lot of kids out here that can play basketball. There's a lot of kids that can just, you can just throw a ball out of the court and they can play. But it's a lot of kids that can't handle the pressures of what my kids went through this year with COVID, you know, being down 10 points in a state in a state championship game, battling their way back in the fourth quarter to outscore the team 27 to, I think, seven or nine or something like that. So, you know, you look at all those things, and um, I'm just proud of these kids, man, and I'm just proud of, you know, I made the decision to come back home. Wow. That's you know, uh, Anthony, like, uh, Mark Mancini out here in Los Angeles, and, you know, you're talking about winning shots and, Coach, and boy, I'll tell you what comes to mind here in this story is Tyus Hetney hitting that shot for UCLA to beat Missouri and having a lot of friends uh, uh, jump on his shoulders. Uh, right. But, you know, when we look at coaching and we see a situation last night with Michigan State and Izzo and, mm-hmm. you know, I, I like the Bobby Knights. I've, I've always liked to, you know, and we could take it even further here in the uh, NBA ranks with Pat Riley. When you coach, mm-hmm. Uh, what's your philosophy, and who did you follow as as, as growing up that the to have that same kind of philosophy and take it into the coaching aspects? I think uh, well, my father was actually a basketball coach when I was coming up. He uh, and so I watched film with him all the time, and I think that's where I get my preparation and things from. As far as watching film, you know, I'm still watching film now, and getting my team prepared for next year because I know I have certain guys coming back, so I know I want to go ahead and get an idea of what we're going to do for next year. But um, as far as, you know, on the college ranks and professional ranks, I think I really admire people like, um, you know, Dean Smith, of course, because I was a Carolina fan. Um, You know, I watched John Thompson, his teams at Georgetown, and I also liked uh, Rick Pitino. 
I actually liked him when he was back at uh, Kentucky. He uh, played a great style. He got after people. But uh, if I had to choose somebody today, I love Shaka Smart. I love his uh, his his havoc that he had at VCU, and I love what he's doing now at Texas. And I actually have them going very deep in the NCAA tournament as a, a sleeper. But um, you know when it, you combine those guys, everything ties into one. That's defense. I'm, I'm a stickler for defense. I, out of my practices, we have about an hour and a half practice, a day, two hour practice. We're in there 45 minutes to 50 minutes on defense alone, and it's just playing principles because I feel like you can play defense, you can rebound the basketball and not turn the ball over, you can beat any team on any given night. You know, even if you're not shooting the ball well, it makes it very hard for the other team to score, you know, constantly applying pressure and constantly, you know, getting after them defensive. And that's what happened in our state championship game. We didn't make a three until, what, the middle of the fourth quarter. And, you know, we were 0 for 10, and then we made two threes in the fourth quarter that busted the game kind of open for us and made them come out of the zone. But our defense kept us in the game. It kept the game close, and it wore them down. So uh, I'm a stickler for that, and you know I just I'm a I'm a basketball I'm a basketball head, man. I, I wake up, I watch basketball, I go to sleep, I'm watching basketball. I'm actually at school right now, and I'm trying to sneak and watch the NCAA tournament and watch the teams that are playing now. So um, I'm just you know I'm basketball 24 uh, seven, and I, I get a lot of that from my father because I watch him all the time, study film and things like that when I was younger. You're listening to Anthony yeah. Atkins here on ATL Prime Sports, uh, orchestrated 14 years ago, the Raiders' comeback in NCAA tournament history. Uh, Anthony, um, I've got to ask you before I get to home, Harlem Goldtrotters, that'll be our last question. This one here is, uh, what did you think about when you heard about the T-shirt story? You're like, wait a minute, no, 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 no. That's not your T-shirt. That is going to be mine, and do you have that T-shirt today? <laughs> I actually do have the T-shirt today. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's a crazy story, man, but I actually do have the T-shirt today. <laughs> you know what? You need to post that baby on Twitter, and we'll retweet it for you. All right, I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> and we'll say, this is our guest today. And we'll have you hanging up the T-shirt, right, so we can see your face with the T-shirt. And I just think it's a remarkable story. Last question before we let you go. Uh, i got about two minutes. Harlem Goldtrotters, right. what was mm-hmm. that like? It was, a, it was a very cool experience. You know, um, I never would have thought I would be playing for their team, but it was a dream come true because it, it had everything that I wanted to do with my life, playing basketball professionally, all wrapped up in one. I made a great living off of it. Uh, I traveled the world for free, and I touched a lot of lives, you know, on a daily basis. And, you know, it it meant a lot to me. For two hours out of my day, I would go out there and we would entertain fans. And, you know, for two hours out of their day, that was the best thing they could possibly have have happen in their life. And when you're doing things like that and you're making people smile and forget about all the problems in the world, you know, it means a lot. And um, that was a great organization. I had a great 12 years. I met a lot of people. I met the Pope. I met President Obama. You know, I mean, I traveled a lot of great places. It was great. And I'll never forget those times. And those times actually helped make me the man who I am today. And I'm forever grateful for being out there for 12 years. Well, sir, we're grateful for you having to come on our show today. We really appreciate it. You've been a fantastic guest. I'm going to let you know you can follow Anthony on Twitter at at Atkinson, A-T-K-I-N-S-O-N, number 12. He's going to post today him holding up the T-shirt, his national (laughs) championship T-shirt. We're going to retweet it on ATL Prime Sports. Mark will do it on Mancina Media. I'll do it on mine. Wayne will do it on his. And, Anthony, you can follow us all. You can follow us at ATL Prime Sports. You can follow Mark at Mancini Media. You can follow, or we tagged you on today's show. You can follow JJ, right. JJ Get You One. You can follow our producer at RWY Jr. And you can follow me at Quarter Todd. And we will, we will tweet that t shirt as you are our guest. <laughs> and we will get it all out there so all kids know to never give up as UCLA did not last night against Michigan State. Yeah, Anthony, we just want to say thank you for coming on. Had a little technical difficulties. We apologize about that, but thank you so much. No problem. And uh, thanks thank for you for being a Harlem Globetrotter. And thanks for being a uh, high school coach, man. That means a lot. Thank you all so much for having me. It was great. Anthony Atkinson. Yeah, we love it, man. 
Unbelievable. Glad to have you back on, Anthony. Have a great weekend. Boy, All right, you what a great safe. interview. You're listening to ATL Prime Sports live on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini Sports. Got RWI Junior, Wayne in the background, Mancini Sports, Quarter Todd. Those are our Twitter handles. TC is joining us right now, and we got a couple more topics to get to before the end of the show. Yes, I'm back on. Thank yeah, he's you, back. Jay. I appreciate it. Appreciate you doing that for me. I appreciate it very much. All right, guys, let's go ahead and go now. Let's go back. Uh, let's well, let's just go ahead and talk about Tom Enzo, and then we'll finish the show. We'll finish up with Deshaun Watson. So, Tom is, though, we know there was an incident last night on the way to the locker room. He grabbed the player by the shorts. Social media is going nuts about it today. Uh, guys, to me, this is a non-story. It just is. I mean, you know, Izzo has great reports from his players. They don't transfer. They don't get in trouble very often at all. And when they do, he does, you see, he does deal with it very swiftly, and, and guys, I, I don't know why people continue to do this. He's an old-school coach from an old-school generation. He doesn't have any problems with recruiting, none whatsoever. Uh, Mark, your thoughts on that? Well, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a bogus thing. I mean, when he's been, what, what he's done for Michigan State and, you know, taking him to the Final Four a few years back, I mean, I, I don't know what's going on these days, but it's just almost like a flip of a switch. Uh, th- these guys, when you're in their programs, and, and, I, and I'll go back to the John Thompson's, the, the, the Patinos, what he's doing at Iowa and all this, I don't know the kid today compared to the kid of yesterday because when I look at it, if I'm in their programs and I know they're going to be tough, they're only making me that much tougher to succeed you know, as far as making my move that much quicker, and I'm absorbing it like a sponge. And I think that we're 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 kind of taking these things out of context here. That you know, grabbing shorts and everything. Let's look at both sides of the story here. I saw the guy walk in and yelling at him, and I don't know. Maybe it was a heat and exchange, but why are we focused on that and we don't focus on what Tom Izzo means to Michigan State and, and getting these guys prepared and stuff? I think as a world today, we focus on negative stuff instead of positive stuff, and it's 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 really troubling to keep hearing this stuff. JJ, your thoughts, real quick. We got about seven minutes left. Yeah, guys, uh, I, I'm kind of diddling with TC and what your thoughts are. I don't. I think this is a non-story. I think kids and uh, the media and everybody in general is getting very sentimental about uh, very small stuff. He didn't. He didn't throw a punch. He didn't do anything. The player was barking back at Tom Izzo in a heated moment in a big-time game, and Tom Izzo wanted to talk to him and thought, hey, this is a coachable moment. Let me get his attention. He probably may not be able to hear me. He grabbed him by the jersey, pulled him a little bit, and said, hey, listen here, and the, and the player rolled, uh, kept walking. Uh, complete, uh, honestly, a little disrespectful to a coach, if you ask me. I've had, and, and let's let's go to a Saturday afternoon in the fall uh, when you're watching the CBS or the ESPN, whichever time slot you like to watch. That happens in college football every Saturday night, folks. Dabo, Nick, Kirby, they'll pull a guy's jersey and say, "Hey, get in there, get out there, get off the field, get on the field." It's the same thing. He was trying to get him and do his coachable moment. He's a coach. He didn't harm the player. No foul. Wayne, the op- Wayne, the optics do not look good, as the announcer said on um, uh, on the game last night. The optics do do not look good. But look, there's more to it, Wayne, than the optics. This guy is a Hall of Fame basketball coach, taking his team to 23 consecutive NCAA tournaments. Took over for Judd Heathcote at Michigan State, who had led the Spartans to the title in 79 under Magic Johnson. Wayne, your thoughts on the optics? Well, as far as I can tell, uh, it looked like the player just got a little bit emotional uh, towards the end of the game, and it carried over through uh, the walk to the locker room. And as the coach was uh, saying something to him, he acted out on it. And I don't really put any fault on the player or the coach for what happened there. That's just an exchange between coach and player. I agree. I agree with all you guys. Uh, today is a different world. And look, this, this is what's going to happen on social media. 
This is what's going to happen with the mainstream media. They're always going to try to stroke something up that's not there. All right, guys, let's move on. Let's go back to the Deshaun Watson situation. We got less than four minutes to go. Um, we, we mentioned at the beginning of the show that more and more women are coming out. This is going to put a stress on the Houston Texans to not only trade him potentially before the draft, but now to trade him any time after the draft because this story now has legs. Whether it's true or not, we'll let the process play out, as Nick Saban and others would say. In the meantime, the NFL will do its due diligence. The Houston Texans will, and so will other teams in the NFL because they're not going to touch him until the situation gets resolved. Correct, Mark? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Wayne Gretzky once said when he played uh, against the New Jersey Devils being part of the Edmonton Oilers, this is a Mickey Mouse operation, and the Houston, Texas are a Mickey Mouse operation. I mean, there's just been so many problems with that organization. J.J. Watts wanted out of there and all that. Uh, you know, when you look at the situation here, the, the more women that come to the forefront, it's not making it look good for Deshaun Watson. Uh, you know, and maybe that's one of the reasons why he wants out of town. I don't know. Like you said earlier in this uh, conversation to start the show that we got to see this thing all play out and everything, but – you started getting to three, four, five of these women coming to the forefront. You know, now you got a situation uh, where it, it really doesn't look good. And, and my thoughts go right to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Como out there in New York where they got about eight, nine women coming after him to resign. So it's a situation until we find out what's going on. You're absolutely right. Nobody's going to take a chance on it until the NFL investigates. We got about two and a half minutes left in the show, JJ. Mark mentioned the Houston Texans story could be a Mickey Mouse organization, but I could flip the script here and say maybe it isn't the Houston Texans at all. Maybe they maybe they see something that you know they want to keep Deshaun Watson, but he doesn't want to be with them. Does that make them a Mickey Mouse situa- uh, organization because they want to trade him? I know they made some mistakes under the previous coach O'Brien, but your quick thought. No, I, I mean, here's the deal. I'm going to keep it to the facts. We know that right now these are all allegations, and right now the Texans have not fielded any trade offers for the for the quarterback. So I feel like they are willing to work through this and see these allegations through, and hopefully they are just that. But, again, I'm not going to go against any woman nowadays that makes an allegation like this. Uh, Deshaun Watson will have his day in court, and we'll see this through. But this is now seven – different uh, massage therapists uh, that, have, that have claimed mi- sexual misconduct during a massage from the Houston Texans quarterback. This does not look good, no matter which way you cut it. It doesn't look good. And we have, uh, Wayne, about 20 seconds. Your quick thoughts um, about it. Well, typically on stuff like this, before I make a public uh, response, I'm going to wait 48 hours. Mm-hmm. Privately, uh, I can talk to you guys all day what I feel about it. But until 48 hours passes, I don't really think I'm going to have any comment on it. Well, you know what, Wayne? Like That's it. an excellent way to end it. We'll wait and see <laughs> what happens. Take it one step at a time. Let the evidence be pre- you know, presented to all of us. And then we can all make an accurate judgment. Guys, it's been a great show today. I want to thank Anthony Atkinson for coming on. Uh, I want to thank you, Mark Mancini in Los Angeles, Jay on, uh, JJ on the other side of the ATL. Wayne, thank you for producing our show, as always, uh, from Memphis, Tennessee. I'm Todd Corder here in Atlanta. Thank you for another sh- uh, joining us live on ATL Prime Sports. We'll have a show next week, and we'll have one again live next Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great weekend, everybody. Get you one. 